Hello, and welcome to this magical talk in the magical world of Toronto, Canada. Uh, it's not really that magical. We have construction, though. Uh, and this is the talk on the occult and GP Apple GPU. I'm Alyssa Rosenzweig, your resident witch, and we'll be going on a magical adventure. Ooh. For some introduction, let's meet the, the wizards we'll see on the way. There are four of them, not just one when you follow the yellow brick road. That would be Dougal Johnson, who reverse engineered most of the instructions that we'll be talking about today. Hector Martin, who's been uh, spearheading the whole Linux on M1 project. Sven Peter, who is our uh, resident kernel hacker, and myself. Uh, as is tradition for any fruit-related device, uh, there is the disclaimer that this was designed by Asahi in Canada and was assembled by cheap labor in, wait, also Canada. That was me. I don't get paid for this. Uh, fine. <laughs> to start off, I would like to talk about the DCP. Uh, this is a, uh, today we'll be talking about the graphic stack on the uh, Apple M1. And like any uh, ARM system, there is the display processor, uh, this, which is responsible for HDMI, and the uh, GPU, which is responsible for the 3D rendering. And these are two unrelated um, blocks of proprietary Apple hardware. Uh, we'll be talking about both today. So first, I would like to talk about the DCP, which is responsible for the display side. Uh, the DCP is the acronym. Uh, based on our best guess, based on the behavior of it, it stands for Diabolical Cluster Puck. Wait, that can't be right. This is the display coprocessor. Uh, it manages the display controller. It is not the display controller. That's a key distinction. Uh, it is a coprocessor that has its own coprocessor. It's coprocessors all the way down. There are seven megabytes of firmware on this thing. Linux or Mac OS does not talk to the display controller itself. Those registers are just not even in the device tree. There's this massive pile of firmware with its own pile of firmware that does all of the display controller interaction. And we just have a uh, API to deal with in the kernel space. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know either. Like, what, what, what is happening here? <laughs> um, the DCP runs the RTKit operating system. This is the real-time kit. It is Apple's secret real-time operating system that is running on every piece of firmware, uh, or not every, with the exception of the secure enclave, which has its own secure enclave operating system. It's running on essentially all of the uh, coprocessors on Apple devices. It's also running on things like the AirPods. Um, it's a fairly large operating system, not by a, you know Linux or Mac OS standards, but by the sorts of things you'd run on a firmware with, with real-time constraints. I mean, it's a whole system. Um, and for our purposes, we're not interested in RTKit per se. We're just interested in, in interfacing with it. And all of the RTKit processors have a standard interface over uh, shared memory, because this is a system on chip, which means we have that shared memory, um, which is very high performance. And there is a physical mailbox, which is symmetric between the uh, application processor running Linux and the uh, coprocessor running RTKit. And this just lets them send uh, about 64, bytes, 64 bits of data uh, per message, which means you're not actually sending commands for the DCP in this case over the mailbox. You're just sending a command with a uh, essentially a pointer to shared memory uh, to look up the actual command, which could be uh, several kilobytes in some cases. Again, w why we don't, yeah. Uh, I'm here to explain what Apple has done in their design. I am not here to explain why anybody thought these were good cho design choices. <laughs> At any rate, the DCP is worse than just any old RT kit firmware. The other RT kit firmwares, they are at least on a very well-defined interface. Uh, the system management controller, for example, it has a very simple interface based on uh, key values and you, some interrupts and that sorts of things. It makes sense. The kernel driver for it makes, okay, it doesn't make sense, but by Apple standards, it makes sense. The DCP, on the other hand, <laughs> the firmware is a massive pile of object-oriented C++ code, not C code. And the whole thing is just based on arbitrary remote procedure calls. There's not a defined ABI between the application processor and the DCP. You're just making calls across one processor to the next processor. It's worse because the calls that you make, 
you might need to make other calls to respond to them, and the DCP might need to make more calls to respond back and forth. And so in effect, you have a call stack that crosses the, across multiple coprocessors, all on a completely unstable ABI. So every single time macOS updates and there's a kernel update with a firmware update, the entire ABI changes. All of the enumeration of calls is completely different, which means we can't even just pin one version of the firmware because there will be changes in the future. Uh, we're just stuck trying to deal with all of these different pieces of slightly different firmware at the same time and being denied access to hardware. And I can't even complain because apparently this is the status quo for macOS now because macOS is doing the same exact interface we are. The only benefit that macOS gets that we don't is that they can pin a specific version of firmware for every kernel because they're able to distribute a single kernel image uh, bundled with the firmware. We don't have that luxury since we need to be able to support uh, different distribution kernels uh, with a given piece of uh, macOS firmware on the DCP. And so you might ask, where did this massive pile, seven megabytes of C++ firmware come from? While we haven't done too much forensics on it, the most likely scenario would seem to be uh, that they just took their old iPhone display driver, split it in half like it's a sandwich, and then stuck one half on the application processor and stuck the other half on the uh, DCP and called that a design. Why this is desirable? Uh, again, my magic only goes so far. How does this look in Linux? Well, it's very goofy. Um, we're still going to expose a, a basic DRM driver the same way any other display controller would work. It's still a KMS driver. Uh, we're still supporting the full Atomic API, but it's really goofy looking. Um, usually the display drivers are taking in the changes in the, the uh, graphic state from DRM and then uh, setting registers to actualize it on the hardware. And then there's a ton of work to uh, pipe the interrupts through for vBlank and so forth, hot plug. And uh, it's, you know, hardware drivers. We don't get that luxury. We're just a remote, we're just doing remote procedure calls all the way down. And by the way, we're writing it in C code, not C++, despite the fact that we're interacting with a C++ API that has classes and objects is just part of the uh, definition of the API, which is, you know, the driver is haunted by the ghosts of IO Surface and IO Kit and all of these Appleisms, which really belong in the space of macOS and which we really would like to keep in the space of macOS, except for the fact that, well, we don't have that choice. Oh, well. <laughs> so, again, what is happening here? I mean, taking a step back, taking some of the emotion out of it for a little bit. Um, yes, it's goofy looking. Yes, it, I'm a little scared of the maintenance burden, but it's actually not very much code relative to other display drivers. And I mean, it works. Uh, I'm giving this talk from Linux on my M1 device right now. Uh, the Okay, that's, that's half true. Uh, the camera is on my phone, but the slides are all being presented from GNOME at four, uh, 4K60 on my M M1 Mini, and uh, the audio is going over audio, USB headphones. And I mean, it's entirely possible that I'm just speaking to myself because the whole setup has collapsed. Uh, but if you are hearing this, the drivers work. <laughs> I hope you're hearing this. Uh, so that's all I want to say about the diabolical cluster puck for now. I mean, the display coprocessor for now. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn our attention to the other half of the Apple graphics stack on the M1, and that is the AGX. Uh, this is most likely the Apple graphics or Apple graphic accelerator. Um, the fact that it's called AGX does not bode well for those of you who uh, are still haunted by PowerVR, which has SGX and RGX. Actually, I'll do you one worse. In the Apple device tree, the node for the AGX GPU uh, is labeled SGX. I don't even want to think about the implications of how that came about. <laughs> at, at any rate, the AGX is the uh, Apple GPU. Uh, it is like its PowerVR predecessor, a Tyler. Uh, the instruction set is uh, very modern, very forward-thinking. 
it's purely scalar, not this half scalar, half vector dance that uh, a lot of, uh, for example, the, the modern Mali GPUs do and the AMD GPUs do. This is just scalar all the way down. There's no, uh, there's no silliness around SIMD widths like the Intel instruction set. All in all, it's actually a really lovely instruction set to program for. Um, and it was a lot of fun bringing up a compiler for it. And even the scheduling model, from what we can tell, seems very sane, uh, since it's the details of the internal pipeline don't get exposed to the compiler. Uh, so if you just write code like you would write assembly by hand, that will be functionally accurate in every case we're aware of. Uh, the only scheduling-like work that the, that is functionally required is just dependency weights for and scoreboard sporting for uh, textures and uh, memory loads. Uh, that said, it does appear that the uh, hardware is dual issue or maybe multi issue or so something along those lines. Uh, so, so there is a performance benefit to reordering instructions in a cert to group them in certain ways. And so you will see the Apple compiler reordering a little bit. For the most part, it's I'm not worried about scheduling for this hardware in the same way I would be for just about every other GPU out there. So uh, after the, I, I mean, I guess nice instruction set, evil display coprocessor, I guess that averages out to a uh, just average level of insanity in your uh, graphic stack because everybody has some something insane in their graphic stack. Don't even get me started on the... Uh, rock chip one. The other key point that I'd like to emphasize about the Apple GPU is that Apple has their own graphics rendering API, uh, Metal. The, there is no support for Vulkan except uh, partial support via a third-party Molten Vulkan. There is very limited support for OpenGL and OpenGLES. Uh, I have not seen a conformance submission for either in years from Apple, and it's even when things are functional there, it's not clear that it would be using the hardware in an optimal way uh, simply because uh, it's not the priority. And the bottom line is that this is a part made for metal. It, it has all the features needed to efficiently uh, implement metal. It does not have all the features necessary to uh, implement OpenGL. And we'll see the implication of that in a second because we do support AGX and Mesa now. The, uh, initial code for this landed in April of 2021. Uh, it's seen uh, active entry development since then, and it's a totally standard OpenGL driver in Mesa using the Gallim 3D infrastructure for the driver. Uh, totally normal stuff, just a command stream. There's really, a, I was going to present about it, but there's really nothing special here. It's it's a Gallium driver, what am I supposed to say? And there's an R compiler, which Again, totally standard. NUR is a joy to work with. Uh, huge kudos to Jason and friends for making a uh, immediate representation that's uh, totally lovely. And it compiles to the hardware, which again, the instruction set is uh, lovely. So we're all good. We have our OpenGL driver, right? Well, we're still reverse engineering this thing and Metal lacks key OpenGL features, which means that when we hit one of these features, we have just a few options. We could be one, non-conformant, not an option. Uh, so we'll call that option zero. Uh, so zero, non-conformant. One, uh, we could just emulate it in some highly inefficient way in some cases, or just a mildly inefficient way. And we, we have to do this in a couple cases. We could two, try to reverse engineer what little OpenGL support is uh, present in uh, Mac OS, but this is non-trivial since the GL environment there is frankly harder to work with than the one on Android. And if any of you have uh, had to reverse engineer on Android before, uh, that should paint a picture. Or three, uh, well, four, but three if we're counting from zero, uh, just try to guess our way through. And that di that does work, right? <laughs> um, I was able to guess the magic numbers, ooh, magic, uh, for drawing quads, for example. That was fine, but... It's not a uh, not a fun time because again, part made for metal. We're not supporting metal on Linux. We're supporting GL and eventually Vulkan. There's a huge impedance mismatch there. The 
one thing that we have to our benefit uh, is that metal in many ways is close to Vulcan in its capabilities, which means uh, most of the problems we're facing have already been faced by the zinc, the zinc driver. And in other cases, a lot of the stuff removed in hardware from AGX uh, was already uh, removed from the AMD hardware, which means uh, you have Radian SI and uh, ACO as your cheat sheet on how to handle those. <laughs> so it's frustrating, a little annoying, but not anywhere near the league of the DCP. So I best should not complain because the AGX all in all is a nice GPU. So it's natural that we have some fun with AGX. Let's talk about divergence. There are lots of ways to handle divergence in hardware. Uh, for there is the not or divergence in graphics hardware. Uh, the non way is to just do no uh, warping whatsoever, just like a CPU, and then there's no problem. However, modern GPU designs want to execute multiple threads at the same time. Uh, in at minimum, have four threads together. Um, usually uh, 8, 16, maybe even up to 64 in the case of AMD. And the problem with doing this is that if one thread tries to branch in one direction and the other thread branches another direction, for example, if you have an if statement, uh, then which one do you execute? Well, you have to execute both and turn off some threads at some point, turn off the other half at the other point, and try to reconcile that. And so there are different strategies on how to handle divergence. Uh, the easiest to work with for the compiler is what Molly does, uh, where it gives you the same exact interface you would have on a CPU. You have conditional branches. You just write the code like you would write uh, x86 assembly or ARM assembly. And there is a dedicated piece of hardware uh, which handles reconvergence, that is, uh, determines when threads need to be enabled and disabled. Uh, and Aside from some basic hinting about the control flow, flow graph that the compiler has to give, uh, it's very simple to compile for. So that's one end of the spectrum. The complete other end of the spectrum would be what AMD does, uh, which to my understanding is have the compiler manage everything itself. You have the execution masks for which threads are executing at once, and it's up to the compiler to manage that itself and do all of the analysis that Molly would be doing in hardware. That, from what I understand, is rather annoying for the ACO compiler to deal with. But again, it's, it's clear where that would come from. Apple, on the other hand, has a, to the best of our knowledge, completely novel approach for this. Their entire handling of divergence is based around this idea that your control flow graph has, is nested. So when you're when there's no divergence, there's zero nesting. When you have an if you're inside an if statement, there's one layer of nesting. If you have an, a for loop inside of an if statement, that's two layers of nesting, and so forth. And the whole technique is just counting the layers of nesting and working from there. Yeah, I, I don't know either what to make of that, but let's see how that plays out in practice. <laughs> Uh, AGX uh, has 32 threads in a warp, which is uh, a fairly standard number for a desktop GPU. Uh, it has a execution mask, which is implicitly there, but which, unlike uh, other GPUs, is not accessible in assembly. Uh, it has to be managed implicitly, and we'll see how you do that in a moment. It, it does have an explicit count of nesting in the control flow graph, and this is just a 16-bit register a general purpose register that when you are doing control flow uh, gets reserved for this nesting count. And then it has two classes of uh, control flow instructions, we'll say. The first are jumps that are completely warp static. They apply to the entire set of 32 threads at once, uh, which means you can't have divergence from them. And the other are uh, structured uh, control flow instructions. And it's, it seems funny to talk about an if statement instruction or a while loop instruction, but that's very much how it's expressed in the AGX assembly. And these are uh, internally, they're essentially arithmetic operations that are responsible for manipulating this nesting counter uh, and manipulating the execution mask register, uh, 
in implicit register, which means when used correctly, it, it does correspond to the control flow that you're trying to do internally, but uh, it's not always obvious how to take these primitives and map it back to, uh, say, NUR's control flow, which is our job as a compiler. So for a recap, what do we have in NUR? Something much more simpler. There are if-else statements, there are infinite loops, and there are breaks and continues out of the infinite loops. That's it. So how do we map these? Uh, the easiest mapping we can do would be for an if statement. And because we have this if statement instruction, sort of, and the semantic here is that uh, the hardware, when it gets this if statement instruction, will evaluate the condition. And then based on the condition, uh, if the condition fails, it will increase the nesting count by one and then update the execution mask. So if you think what that means, uh, if a thread is active going into this and then the condition fails, it, it will have a nesting count of one now and then it will be inactive and then it won't execute the body of the loop. However, if it, there are zero levers, levels of nesting to, act, to become active again uh, at the uh, top and the condition is true, then this if statement instruction does nothing because it's still active after and it executes the body of the loop. And then at the end, we have to do, uh, end the if statement by popping off this one layer of nesting. So then the threads that are active do nothing because it saturates at zero. There's no negative levels of nesting, but the threads that are uh, sk sk uh, skipped the if statement uh, currently have their thread count, thread nesting level at one. So they it pops down by one and now they're active again because it's down to zero. However, uh, the point of counting nesting is that if this if statement were embedded in a larger uh, if statement or for loop or something, uh, there could be other threads that were already inactive going into this if statement. So by adding to the nesting count, uh, they will not only continue to skip this if statement, uh, they will have their uh, levels of nesting restored at the end by the pop. And uh, this is sort of the point of having this nesting count as opposed to manually managing the execution mask. So it's if you look at this assembly, it's sort of clear where this comes about, but it's also very clearly strange. But I digress. Uh, how do we extend this to if else statements? It's just as simple. Uh, we now have an else instruction in the middle that operates just as the logical complement, in a sense, of the if statement. So it will then swap all of the threads that have uh, act thread count or nesting count one to nesting count zero, making them active, and make all of the counts uh, threads with count zero, so currently active, make them one so they're inactive, then pop at the end. Great. This makes sense. It works. It passes the tests. What about loops? This is where things get kind of tricky and kind of complicated, and uh, it will take us a number of steps to figure out how to get this right. So our first try would just be using this jump instruction. Uh, we have this warp static jump, so we can just use that to loop through the same number of instructions over and over. Um, and we are using, in particular, this jump if any are active uh, jump. But so, fine, it's a loop not the kind of loop that NUR wants, because this is a loop for the 32 threads at once, not for just any one thread like NUR semantic. And there's no way to break out of it either. So our next thing to try is using the actual while instruction, which, again, remember, the, the uh, control flow inst in arithmetic instructions are not actually doing any control flow. They're just manipulating the execution mask and the nesting count which means this while instruction alone would have no way to jump back. So we need both the while instruction and also the jump together. And you have them both together at the end of the loop. And so the trick that we have here uh, is that, uh, well, the, the way that this while loop is, instruction is working then uh, is, uh, in this case, it's just always, um, Well, 
we'll see what we need in a moment. Um, the moral of the story is that we can still break out. We can now break out of this by manipulating the nesting count ourselves because it's just a register. So as a very simple example, uh, if we are active, uh, we have a nesting count of zero, but if we want to become inactive, we can set the nesting count to one and then uh, force the execution mask to be uh, re-updated by a sort of no operation uh, control flow instruction. And this has the semantic then of making the thread go inactive. The other threads will continue to execute the loop, but eventually you'll get to the end. And uh, there, if there are no more threads uh, running the loop because they've all, ex they've all uh, become inactive with this uh, while and this pop and this break, then the jump execute any will not do any jump because there's no threads active anymore. Uh, and then we're done, except for the fact that all of your threads aren't active now, but details. Why don't we fix that? It would not be good to uh, only be able to do a loop, and then once you're done with the loop, the whole execution is uh, terminated. Likewise, uh, if, we are, if we have nested control flow, uh, we don't want to clobber that either, uh, which would be what would ha happen uh, with our previous implementation. So in this case, we just need to push the nesting count up by one at the beginning and pop it down by zero at the by one at the end, and things allegedly work out if you do it this way, allegedly. <laughs> um, so this is a good start. It will implement an infinite loop faithfully, uh, which is what NER needs. We can break out of the inner loop. We can even break out of multiple loops at once, but NER does not call for this. But what we can't do, and what there's no obvious way to do, is uh, be able to do, do a continue in a loop. So at this point, you might be very stuck. When I was looking at the notes for this, I was stuck myself, uh, didn't get it myself. And I was just hoping that I, a, uh, magically a little birdie would come and whisper in my ear. And indeed, such a little birdie uh, came named Dougal. And I will, uh, have in, in my ear said, uh, quote the Dougal, continue as a break. We can model uh, a NER loop as a pair of loops instead with the inner one, a, a pair of do while loops where the inner loop only runs for one iteration. So how do we handle this? Well, if we are trying to break out of the logical loop, that's breaking out of the outer loop. So we break out of two le levels of nesting. If we're trying to just uh, continue on the outer loop, then that's, that's equivalent to just breaking out of the inner loop. And so we can implement both break and continue as break with two layers of nesting if we have two layers of nesting on the loop. And the best part about this is that the loop structure, so to speak, is implicit in the values of the nesting count. Uh, so this does not require any more instructions than would require otherwise. Uh, so we can use the same exact code we had before but now instead of using one layer of nesting on each of the control flow instructions, we use two layers of nesting. And this gives us a completely natural way to implement both break and continue, just as different breaks. For a logical break, we break out of two loops. That's the uh, so break out of the outer loop. For the logical continue, we just break out of the inner loop. And it's the, it's the code is symmetric in this case, setting the uh, nesting count and then resetting the execution mask to compensate. Uh, there's only a one little wrinkle we're missing here, and that is uh, what happens if you try to nest uh, this loop inside some other piece of control flow. For example, if you had the loop inside of an if statement, uh, then when you do it this way, after you finish the loops, then uh, everything would be uh, enabled again after, even if you that thread wasn't executing the loop to begin with because it was on the other branch of the if statement. And the solution here is very simple. Uh, it's just to reset to the appropriate level of nesting. Namely, we need to add the numbers of levels of nesting uh, outside of the loop uh, to figure it out. And the other trick we can use here is that NUR only has two types of control flow. One are loops and the other are if statements. And uh, we can't, the break only applies to the innermost loop, which means the only control flow that we're interested in counting is the number of nested if statements. 
And that is trivial to, to do with a little bookkeeping in the compiler and uh, have working breaks and continues. And that finally will pass all of our control flow tests and we'll be very happy because, you know, now we have control flow on our compiler. Woohoo! Not efficient control flow, but conformant control flow. So uh, wrapping it up, the uh, current status for this is that we have the DCP driver uh, functional uh, in a downstream uh, fork of the kernel. Uh, I'm hoping to send off the initial RFC of, of these patches in the next few months, but there is a lot of cleanup to do. The code is functional, but not pretty to look at. Uh, as for AGX, the code is upstream in Mesa, passing about 95% of the DQP uh, GLS2 tests. Uh, however, that comes with the massive caveat that is passing those tests under Mac OS, not under Linux, because we still have to write a uh, kernel driver for AGX to be our glue between the Mesa user space and the AGX hardware uh, on Linux. And uh, we're again hoping to have that uh, in the next few months. So uh, thank you and happy to answer questions. And uh, just before we go, I, I would like to point out if I can figure out how to share my screen. Uh, stop sharing screen, start, select, uh, entire screen. Uh, I have been do doing this talk from my M1 device. See, Apple, Apple Mac Mini M1 2020. So uh, it works. I mean, works, but it works. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Now for the Q&A. Ryan Hudek asks, does pushing and popping execution masks go to memory or, sort of, or some hardware stack? Uh, right. So uh, there's not an explicit stack to the hardware. Uh, there is a imaginary stack that the compiler gets to keep track of. Uh, the only hardware state you have is the execution mask, so 32 bits per warp, and the uh, nesting counter, which is really a count of levels of nesting until the thread becomes active again. Uh, and this is a 16-bit re general purpose register that gets tied up for control flow and one per thread. Okay, person1337 asks, what are the biggest features missing from Metal relative to OpenGL? Does Dapl implement OpenGL ES for WebGL? Uh, right, so... If I were to design hardware, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of features in OpenGL which I would say are stupid and which I wouldn't want to include because they're uh, useless, slow, et cetera. And eventually I would cave and implement them anyways because real applications use them. And even if well-written applications don't need them, um, translation layers, for example, uh, Wine would still want them. And Apple has the luxury of being able to look at the same exact sets of features and just saying, you know what, we don't need those. We're getting rid of them in hardware. So all of the, basically anything that's deprecated in OpenGL, uh, you're not going to find hardware support for in the M1. Uh, anything, huge amounts of the geometry pipeline are done in shaders, uh, which is fast enough in practice. Um, I suspect transform feedback will have to be done in software, not because I've actually tested that theory, but because why on earth would they put transform feedback hardware on a part made for metal uh, and so on and so forth. So it's the net result is that um, well-written applications on Linux will run just as fast uh, as their metal counterparts, but uh, there will be a lot of hoops to jump through if we ever want to become conformant and support uh, all the random ancient legacy things and want to pass all the piglets. Okay, Neobrain asks, any idea how the AGX design compares to PowerVR? Have you found any similarities so far based on what Little Imagination publishes? Uh, I haven't studied the what Imagination has published, um, and PowerVR is, of course, the last remaining a GPU to not have a Mesa driver, as far as I'm aware, so I can't comment there. Um, the high-level design is similar in that they're both Tylers. They are both uh, 
okay, I guess that's where the similarities end. <laughs> um, they, Apple cl clearly designed the uh, their, the AGX GPU um, for the iPhone with the purpose of having similar performance characteristics to the existing power VR parts. And it was not a atomic switch. Uh, it's our, it's my understanding that there were uh, power VR parts with Apple instruction sets at one point, shipping on iPhones and so on. And all of that was pretty much invisible to iOS developers uh, because the performance characteristics didn't really change. The high level design was essentially unmodified, even though all the details got swapped out. Okay, Radek Schwichtenberg asks, are there big differences between M1 for Mac Pro versus Mac Mini or Air? How much do you think it will be needed to support newer versions? Um, it's the same system on chip. You know, M1 is M1. Um, there are slight, there are differences in binning. The MacBook Air M1 has one less GPU that or core than the other uh, M1 devices, which that's if that software visible at all, it will be a short amount of code in the kernel. I imagine not something user space worries about. Um, th then there are the hardware, the different Macs are different themselves. For example, the Mac mini has ethernet and USB type A ports, and we have drivers for that in Linux. The MacBooks don't, but the MacBooks do have a camera and will need a camera driver that the Mac mini doesn't. So I personally have a Mac mini. I don't have any plans to get a MacBook. So that's where my development is biased, uh, but we're hoping that Asahi Linux will support everything eventually. And one last question, Patrick Jacobson asks, is the DCP firmware redistributable or do you need something like a download script like we have for FaceTime HD webcam drivers? So this is a very interesting question. I wish I touched on this earlier. Uh, it's not redistributable, but that doesn't actually matter for our case because Linux never touches this firmware. Uh, it's it, it's on a internal system partition. So it's on the internal storage, but not on the operating system partition. It's loaded by the bootloader. Uh, presumably it's signature checked by the bootloader and then the firmware is locked. So the operating system, be it Mac OS or Linux, uh, just does not touch this firmware. This is unfortunate to us because it means uh, we can't modify the, the firmware to be less ridiculous. Uh, replace it with an open source version, even if we wanted to. However, it neatly avoids all of the legal questions uh, because there's, from Linux's perspective, uh, there's no firmware being used at all. And this is one of the great ironies of Asahi Linux to me is that with the exception of the, wi the Wi-Fi, everything will work on Linux Libre. And this is very, very much not a Libre chip. <laughs> Okay, looks like that's it for today. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much for your great talk, Alyssa. And thank you for having uh, me. have a great conference. I will now magically poof out of existence. <laughs>